present to you a culturally incorrect agent of redemptive change and a real American hero, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Pastor. Thank all of you for being here. I, I, I couldn't see. Could I? Please, please. How many of you are, are here for the first or second time? Good. That's good. That's wonderful. I, I want to... In, in the time we have this morning, I, I want to just share a few thoughts with you along the lines of what Pastor Parsley was talking about. One, will we fight? And number two, should we remain silent given the clash of culture and civilizations that we're seeing right now? And I, and I want to give you my context. Part of it was what the pastor described. I, I've spent most of my 64 years in and around the armed forces of the United States. I grew up with a hero, my dad, who was a soldier. All of my brothers have served in combat. And I'm blessed to have the job now where literally all I do, my only beat for Fox News, and by the way, thank you mate, for making Fox News the number one cable news outlet in the world, because it wouldn't have happened without you. My only beat for Fox News is to hang around with heroes. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardsmen, and Marines. Thank the Lord I don't have to run around and wait for a politician to say something memorable. I, I don't have to worry whether Brittany's going to shave her head. All I do is cover those remarkable Americans that we have, who have served and who are now serving in our armed forces. And that's my context for that. I will also share something with you. In, in my line of work, the media, it's kind of like speaking in tongues when no one understands you. And so I, I, I make observations about it. My colleagues, as we call ourselves in the media, we're, we're colleagues to one another. My colleagues are always kind of wondering if I've ever learned anything about the business. In fact, the way they normally put it is, have you learned anything yet? So yeah, I've, I've learned that there's parallels between the media and the military. That they both take casualties. Usually in the media, it's when they fall off their egos and they land on their IQs, but it's, it's about... And, and I'll, one, of the, one of the wonderful blessings I've got is I get to go out there and, and literally live with these youngsters day in and day out. Chuck Holton, who's the editor of this new book, right here, Chuck Holton. And think about this team an old Marine, and a young United States Army Ranger. Chuck Holton, stand up here. Where, where'd you go? Where did he go? He disappeared on me. He's that quick. Chuck's in the back. There he is, way up in the, on the balcony. He's with his camera out. That's kind of like when you travel in Iraq with him. You can never quite tell where he is. We, we, get, to, we get to cover a side of these youngsters that, for whatever reason, my colleagues in the mainstream media just don't get it. Now, it, it, that's not all they don't get. I, I just tell you a quick story. And, and one of the things that we do rely on is feedback from people who are watching the show. I had just had a debate. One of the shows that I'm on most often is Hannity and Combs. You have to understand it's 4 a.m. in the morning out there. It's 9 p.m. Eastern back here in the States. And I'll get a call around 2 in the morning saying from John Finley, his producer, Hannity's producer, saying, can you come on with us tonight? And of course, sure, I'm sleeping there with my flak jacket, my helmet, I got my phone in my pocket, the satellite telephone, it'll buzz, and I'll wake up and look at it, yep, it's New York calling. Hey, can you come on? Sure. So, right, we've been in bed for a whole half hour, we'll get up again in two, and we'll go live with you. And, and my kids tell me later on, Dad, you can tell you just got up because you have helmet head. Your hair is sticking out in all kinds of weird directions. And I always try to stand next to one of the youngsters that we're covering from whatever branch of that. Maybe my camera that got the gunfight earlier that day, but it's one of those eyewitness participants standing next to me 
who's describing it to the American people. And we have these little tiny satellite transceivers to give us feedback. And they send us emails literally as they're happening. And I brought one of them with me today. And I, and I just want to share this. I had just had a discussion with Alan Combs, Hannity's co-host. You know, Hannity keeps talking about how he's Hannitized America. Well, Combs is still a liberal. Just an observation. And I've just said to, I've said to Combs, I said, you don't get it. Ground combat is the worst experience any human can have. I'm standing in the wrong spot. Sorry, God. <laughs> Ground combat's the worst experience any human can have. And immediately comes back an email, and it says this. And we're seeing it in the little transceiver. Colonel North, you just said on Hannity and Combs that ground combat is the worst experience any human can have. This is not true. The worst experience any human can have is spending time with my mother-in-law. My best friend spent two years in Iraq, did a tour of duty in Afghanistan. He lost his right hand in Fallujah. He has met my mother-in-law. I just called him. He says, it's not even a close call, Jim in San Diego. Now, now that's one form of feedback. That's, I mean, it kind of tells you where your audience is. There's another form of feedback. I'm a person who believes devoutly in the power of prayer. I'm a person who sees, I think, graphically, the remarkable courage, commitment, compassion, and faith of these youngsters that we cover out there. I've spent my lifetime in the armed forces or around them. I have never seen so many young men and women who are so willing to read from this book on a regular basis. Now this is, by the way, not one of my novels. Every word in this book is true. And they know it. And so, and so when you have a youngster who's just bold, not only about what he's doing out in the field, leading young soldiers or Marines or SEALs on these incredible missions, but they also are bold about their faith. And you say to one of them, what gives you such confidence? And one of them looks you in the eye and he says, well, you see, I know where I'm going and I know why I'm going there. Now, if you don't understand what I just said, you come up and see me later and I'll explain the rest of it. Because it doesn't have anything to do with how good their armor is. It doesn't have anything to do with how courageous they are in the field. And I said to one of them, you tell me what that means to you. He said, I'll tell you very simply, sir. It's the words of Paul to the church in Rome as was struggling against incredible oppression. And Paul writes, if you confess, if you, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that Christ was raised from the dead by God the Father, you will be saved. Now that's pretty straightforward. That's pretty clear. That's a straightforward statement of where these guys, what these guys believe. Now either those words are true or this book isn't. Here's, here's what's so, so bold about them. The pictures we have in this book, the pictures of these youngsters gathered in prayer as they get ready to go on a mission, the pictures of these youngsters who are literally kneeling and praying with one another aren't staged. They are pictures that weren't taken of guys getting ready for a football game. These are youngsters who are going out into harm's way and they know from remarkable experience they may not come back. And they're bold about it. For Lord knows what reason, my colleagues in the mainstream media never show that to you. So I brought just a few frames with me today so you have, an, you have a word picture, of you will, if you will, of what has become the brightest, best educated, best trained, led, and equipped armed force the world has ever seen. Full of remarkable young Americans. 
who rarely get the credit for what they do. Average age is 20 and a half. Average education, 14 years, meaning two years post high school. They, in addition to what they've been taught at boot camp or had in college before they came into the service, they've also been taught ballistics and physics and chemistry and biology and avionics and electronics and they operate and they maintain the most sophisticated weapons and equipment ever designed by the hand and mind of man. They can take a life or save one with it. They can use their bodies like a weapon and their weapons like they're part of their bodies and yet they are also some of the most remarkably compassionate men I have ever seen. I've spent months in the field with them. Lord knows why my colleagues like to spend most of their time back in the green zone broadcasting from air-conditioned hotel rooms doing what we call balcony shots. But when you're out there in the field with them and you live with them for weeks on end, you see these remarkable professions of faith. You know, I've kind of concluded that that, that Lord that promises us that if we confess with our lips that He is Lord and believe in our hearts that the Father raised Him from the dead, He doesn't care what brand of car I drive. He doesn't care about the name on the church that I go to. What He is asking of me is that I stand as a witness, not just talk the talk, but do what these guys do, and that's walk the walk. This young man that's in that picture is also on the back of this book. It's the last picture in the book, the last page. United States Navy corpsman, second class petty officer. First combat tour was in Afghanistan in 2001. He is now the senior corpsman with the rifle company with which I am embedded. And the smoke pall you see is Baghdad. We're about 12 miles south of the city. We're driving toward that smoke pall, and the unit is ambushed by a Republican Guards regiment. And there's a terrible gunfight going on in the back. You can see it in the frames of the footage. Several Marine casualties occur instantly right out in front, and this young U.S. Navy medical corpsman rushes out into the battlefield and immediately rescues wounded Marines, binds them up with battlefield dressings, carries them on his back to the helicopter that lands in the roadway, and I run up on the ramp of the helicopter holding my camera as this guy walks toward him. The third casualty he's got is right there on his back. Right off to the right-hand side, off the frame of my camera, is a Reuters news crew that runs up and sets up the tripod, and they track him as he's carrying this third fighter aboard. That fighter has already been picked up on the battlefield by this U.S. Navy medical corpsman, bound up on the battlefield in what they call the beaten zone, which is between the two opposing forces. He's been shot at. He's bound this guy up, puts him on his back, and carries him to the helicopter, and the shock trauma corpsman aboard the helicopter treat him exactly like the others, but if you look very carefully, the uniform on that guy isn't American. That is a wounded Republican guardsman. And as the corpsman staggers aboard the helicopter and lays him down, the shock trauma corpsman on the helicopter stick an IV in his arm, a blood expander to sheet, treat for shock, wrap him in a shock blanket, put these remarkable inflatable tourniquets up over his shattered limbs, and start treating him exactly the same on a litter as those wounded Marines. Corman staggers back down off the ramp of the helicopter and starts walking back into the gunfight. And the Reuters news crew yells out to him, Hey, mate, what did you do that for? Didn't you notice? In other words, you stupid American, didn't you notice that was an Iraqi? Pastor Parsley, because we're in church, I'll put it, the corpsman gives the Reuters news crew a gesture. And then he says, and then he says, didn't you notice he was wounded? That's what we do. We're Americans. You want examples of courage. You want examples of commitment. You want examples of the kinds of faith that make a difference. You know, one of the ways in which the world is going to be changed is by pastors like Pastor Parsley, 
who will project the word of this book around the world so that others can hear it. And one of the ways in which that's taking effect is that you have youngsters like those out there on the battlefield who are walking the walk. Do you realize this? That everywhere they have been, U.S. Army soldiers, U.S. Navy sailors, U.S. Air Force airmen, U.S. Marines have become the guardians of Muslim women. For the very first time in history, since the schism between the Sunni and the Shia in the 700s, Muslim women are being protected by Christian men and women wearing the uniforms of the armed forces of the United States. And they can see with their eyes the word that is being broadcast to them all over the world. And it's changing things. It's not going to change overnight. This is a terrible war in which young Americans are in harm's way, 160,000 of them today in Iraq, 100, excuse me, 34,000 of them today in Afghanistan, 15 or 16,000 of them in the periphery of the Persian Gulf and the Philippines, all the places that Pastor Parsley just talked about a few minutes ago. Those youngsters are out there, literally, on the line, in harm's way, as living examples of people who know the word. My colleagues, for whatever reason, don't show you that. That's the part of this book that means the most to me. These are youngsters who literally walk the walk every single day. It is a profoundly different vision than you get from those in the rest of the mainstream media. It is a profoundly different perspective than is shared by most of my colleagues. For whatever reasons, they choose not to see it. It is, to my way of thinking, perhaps the most important part of what they are. 1.3 million of them have already served in this war. They are coming home to become the leaders of the next generation of Americans. I would ask you, challenge you here today, that what is called upon from all of us is two things. One, the very simple act of saying thank you when you see one of them. Number two, to pray, pray, pray for this country and especially for them. I say that to you because if you don't remember anything else that you say today, remember this. I stand before you today as living proof of the power of prayer. I, I, I can't... I, I, we don't have enough time here today for me to share how many times I've had the experience of saying, Lord, why did you protect me from that? Now, I know that my son-in-law, who is the pastor of a church himself, when he picks me up at the airport, when we talk to my family at home on my satellite telephone, they will remind me constantly that they are praying for me. I, I know that there are fans who email me all the time at Fox News. We're praying for you when you're out there. That feedback is important as an encouragement to them. It's important to me. Feedback is important. I, I, I tell people all the time, tell them that you are praying for them. I mean, I stand in book lines and people will walk by with pictures of me taken with their sons or their husbands over there and they've emailed them back. And I tell them every time, pray for them and tell them that you are praying for them. That feedback is important. I, I will tell you how important feedback really is. Two quick stories. I'm on a rooftop just before Christmas. I'm standing next to a young soldier who I've been with for weeks on end, and I am getting ready to go home because I promised Betsy that when I, was, when I left home in November, I would be home for Christmas. And so I'm on Hannity and Combs. We do the broadcast, and I realize I'm standing next to a kid who's not going to be home for four or five more months. I'm going home tomorrow. And I say to him, is there anybody at home you want to say hi to, Sergeant? I put the mic in front of him. He said, yeah, I want to say hi to my wife, Jane, my 
my son Tommy and my daughter Susie, I'm sorry I'm going to miss Christmas with you. Please keep me in your prayers. Merry Christmas. And I can hear him screaming in my ear at Fox, you know, we've only got a few seconds left till the, till the commercial break. I take the microphone back and I say, Hannity in New York, back to you. And immediately, as soon as we go cold, as we call it, my sat phone rings. And I look at it, it's, it's my home number. Betsy must have just seen me and she's calling to congratulate me. What a great broadcast. We had magnificent footage. Great little interview with this guy through that green tinge night lens. I punch the little button, I say, hey, honey. How'd I do? And she's, don't, hey, honey, me. Did I just hear you say you weren't going to be home for Christmas? Which, which by the way, proves them. Everybody watches television, but they don't listen. This isn't just a husband-wife thing. Before I can say anything at all, she says, let me tell you, mister, when you left here in November, you promised me you would be home for Christmas. So I'll tell you what, if you don't make it home for Christmas, you might as well stay in Iraq, because you'll be a lot safer there than this kitchen. I made it home for Christmas. Now that's feedback. Some of you, none of you ladies here are old enough to remember this, but some of you guys are. Back in 1980s, actually 1987, 21 years ago this summer, I got asked to come in and chat with some members of Congress. Actually, the truth be known, I was subpoenaed. Yeah. And, and, and the security team that was protecting my, my family and me at the time, six of them took us in an armored Suburban, picked up my lawyer, Brendan Sullivan, the guy who said at one point, I'm not a potted plant, I'm the lawyer here. Well, he picked us, picked Sullivan up, we took an underground garage, we went up in a back elevator, they cleared the hallways, and they brought us to a little holding room right next to the hearing room where the star chamber were, uh, the, uh, congressional room where all this was going to take place. And Sullivan and I got down on our knees and I said, oh God, if there's ever going to be an earthquake in Washington, let it be. The... <laughs> Actually, all I had time to say was, dear Jesus, help me. Please help me, Lord. And then the knock on the door. And it's the armed federal officers who are protecting our family. And they'd gotten a dozen or so Capitol Hill police officers, and they formed a double cordon around Sullivan and me, put the two of us in the middle, and walked us across this cleared hallway to those great oak doors, the entrance to the hearing room. And there's kind of a gaggle there because they can't get everybody through at once. And out of nowhere steps a little lady with white hair. And she reaches through the double cordon, and she puts a card in my hand, this card. Those of you who've still got the tapes, please do not send them. I've got probably 45 or 50,000 copies of them. Because people have sent the old videotapes to us. And you can see as we walk through the room, all the TV cameras are on the inside. And as we're walking through the door, Sullivan is taking this card out of my hand and putting it in his pocket like this. And then you can see, you can't hear for all the noise of the cameras going off. You can see Sullivan saying something. And what he's saying is, don't be reading things other people give you. Just sit down at the table, answer their questions. Let's get this over with. When we sat down at the table, Sullivan takes the card out of his pocket and he props it. There's a microphone stand on that cloth-covered table. And Sullivan takes it out of his pocket and he props it in front of me. And it sat there throughout the entire hearings. Each time we would get up to go, he'd put it in his pocket. We'd come back in after the lunch break or after the whatever, the, up there in the raised dais where the Roman Emperor, uh, the uh, members of Congress were. <laughs> up there on the raised dais. They, could, they, they actually began to wait for Sullivan to take the card out before they'd ask the first question. So by the third or fourth day of the hearings, a reporter comes up to Sullivan and says, I've got to know. What's on the card? Because the cameras are all looking this way, and all they could see the all they could see was the back of the card, just like this. And you, you can see it in all the videotapes, all the still there's the card parked on the microphone stand. That's all you can see of it. The reporter says, What's on the card? And Sullivan says, This card. He says, Yeah, what's on the card? Sullivan looks at it without showing it to him, and puts it back in his pocket and says, The answers. The, the youngsters I cover know the power 
of prayer. They understand the power of prayer. They also understand, as I do, that every prayer is answered, but not always in ways that we can understand it. Because we'll never grasp the power, the majesty, and the mind of God. We can't do it. But He has a purpose. He has a purpose for everything that happens in our lives. Two weeks ago, I had to drive. I, had, I, I flew up to Syracuse, New York, to see my my uncle, a World War II veteran, the last member of my mother's family from World War II. He died, and we went up to the funeral. It was a wonderful event. He knew the Lord. It was a great celebration. It was also one of these examples of what American Airlines can do because they stopped flying all the MD-80s that day, so I had to rent one of Mr. Hertz's fine cars to drive back home. As we're driving back down Interstate 81, I stop, get off to visit John, get a cup of coffee, and get back on. And as I'm coming up the ramp, a little red car whooshes by me at about 80 miles an hour, passes me on the on-ramp, and zooms across three lanes of traffic on Interstate 81, just south of Scranton, mile marker 123. And as, as he does so, he suddenly slams on the brakes because there's an accident right in front of him. And an 18-wheeler just crushes his car, smashes right through it, runs over top of it. I've got four or five pictures. We Two and a half hours. Why do just put these pictures up? Every once in a while you wonder, why am I here, God? What is your purpose for me? If I had been maybe three or four-tenths of a second faster, at that moment, and I unfortunately drive way too fast, way too often. I'd have been right in the middle of this. There's carnage all over this highway. There's four 18-wheelers and six cars and bodies all over the highway. Helicopters landing in the middle of the thing. Why wasn't I in that? I prayed as it was happening on my left shoulder. I pull off to the far right. That's my car off to the far left-hand side of the screen. That's one of Mr. Hertz's Mercury's. The car has got pieces of metal and shrapnel all over it. I told one of the police officers who just sent me a picture yesterday by email, I said, I see mass casualty things like this in Iraq all the time. I've never seen anything like this in the States. There are dead people all over the place, just a fraction of a second different. And I just jerked the wheel hard to the right and right up against the guardrail. Why, did, why, why, Lord? Why? I don't know. I know this. He answered my prayer. Help me, Lord. Help me. Don't know why. I don't know what. Maybe he just wanted me to be here so that one of you who didn't understand what I meant a few minutes ago when I said these guys know where they are going and they know why they are going there. And you'll wonder enough to pick up a copy of this book Get mine too, but get this book and start reading it and read the words, the promises, the promises that are made in this book. If you confess with your lips and you believe in your heart. You know, I, this past Thursday, 1st of May, was the National Day of Prayer. Actually, the first person, as Pastor pointed out, to ask for a National Day of Prayer was Abraham Lincoln. It had been suggested by George Washington, by John Adams, but the first person to actually say we were going to have one was Abraham Lincoln. And, and in 1952, when I was a young pup, Harry Truman finally got it through Congress that we'd have a National Day of Prayer. And so it's the first Thursday of every May, and it just happened to be the first of May this year. And I was invited to speak at a, at a prayer breakfast on Thursday morning down in Fort Myers, Florida. And the orchestrators of it, a, a Protestant minister, a Roman Catholic priest, a Jewish rabbi, asked me to write a prayer. I want to just share that prayer with you and ask you to, to join me in it because it's a prayer that I, I wouldn't pretend to be blessed as you are, brother, with so articulate. But I, I thought given what I do and, and what I've seen, it was kind of appropriate for the time, if you would. Lord of lords and King of kings, we bow before you and no other. 
Lord, we thank you for the bounty beyond measure and the resources too vast to quantify that you have bestowed upon this fruitful land. We are grateful to live among the most diverse, prosperous, and generous population on earth. And Lord, we ask that you deliver us from our enemies for your forgiveness for those things that we have done and that which we have left undone when we strayed from your way. We beseech you for godly, enlightened leaders, your guidance for our president, wisdom for our legislators, justice tempered with mercy from our judges. We beg you for pastors who know your word, teachers who know your name, and parents who sing your praises to their children. Lord, let it be said of us that we were a people who fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith. And Lord, protect those who serve the cause of liberty. And let us be worthy of the sacrifices of your youth who are in peril on land, sea, and in the air. We ask these things in the name of your Son, my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. I want, to, I want you to know how grateful I am for the chance to be with you. I, I will go back out and I will stay as long as you want me to, signing books to those of you who, who want them. If, if you have a connection to someone in the armed forces, if you will simply tell me what branch of the service and their first name, I will personalize it that way. I would ask that if you, if you get one of these books, the most important thing is that you pray for them, when you see them in uniform, that you tell them thank you, and that you remember that those prayers are answered. Oh, one other thing. That card, the card that Sullivan had in his pocket that he took out each time, he said to me when it was all over, he said, you know, you're probably going to want to keep this. People have asked me a thousand times, How come, you didn't look like you even broke a sweat. You didn't look like you, you, you were worried about the outcome at all. And, and guys will tell me that when I'm overseas with them, although I, I, at 130 degrees, I sweat. <laughs> but I, I pray before we get in a Humvee and go out on an operation or walk in a foot patrol through one of these places, knowing that an IED could go off in a heartbeat. There's pictures of young guys who are... I was with literally moments, some cases a day or two before they were killed, or terribly maimed in this book. And I, I did that to honor them and their families. And I don't know why he's answered all those prayers for me, and others were terribly hurt or killed, and I was relatively unscathed. But I know there's a reason. And I know there's a reason not to worry, but to pray. Oh, worry is such a thing. There's so many people who worry. And I will confess to you, it was not a pleasant time sitting there having them go through this day after day, hour after hour for most of the month of July back 21 years ago. But I knew what the outcome of all of this was. I know where I'm going and I know why I'm going there. And so people say, well, what was really on that card? What, what, what inspired you to look so cool and calm? I've carried the card with me ever since. This is what sat on the side that I could see. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not feel faint. Isaiah 4031. Sullivan was right. Those are the answers. God bless you all. Thank you very much for being here.
Uh, excuse me. Have Colonel North come back just for a moment. Just for a moment. Can you, can you have him just step back in just for a moment? They may not be able to hear me. There's a door there. Wow. Is, is he coming? Just for a moment. Just for a moment. I just... Reporting is ordered, sir. <laughs> I just... Uh, Joni just spoke to me. I, I felt like very prophetically, if you will. And that is as Colonel North shows the carnage on the highway and as he speaks about those brave young men and women defending our way of life and truth around the world. And, and he asked the question, why, why not me? Why am I still here? And uh, she said very profoundly to me, she said, because you're a disciple. And I said, well, what, what do you mean a disciple? And she said, his job is the job of a disciple. His job, his assignment is to tell these stories because that's what a disciple is. He's a storyteller. And we need to hear these stories. And you're right, the secular media will not share them with us. But I pray a very special blessing upon Colonel North as he goes forth with this book to tell this story, to encourage our hearts, to encourage us to pray. And I just, I just felt in my heart to tell him you're a disciple. You're a storyteller. Tell the story. Thank you. Oh, let's, let's thank our God for such servants as Colonel Oliver North. Now, we want to...